Hello, thank you for joining me today. Looking to talk a little bit about rational emotive behavioral therapy and how it might be able to change our lives. My name is Carl and I'm a licensed therapist in New York. I'm looking to show you a little bit about my practice and how we try to help people through a couple of different issues, most issues that therapy is able to address. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about specifically showing you the model of the ABCs of emotion which is a generic model that's been used since the 50s. It's one of the first cognitive therapies, and this is a little bit of a model of how it looks. Uh, we'll be taking a little bit of a look at using social anxiety as a template and how we might be able to use a consistent tool that helps us with forging ahead and making some progress. We want to try to see that with rational emotive behavioral therapy, that the way that we see the world affects the way that we feel the world. And if we can change the way that we see the world, we can change the way that we feel the world and try to get rid of some of the symptoms that we're feeling. The other important part, so there's two parts. The first is to try to get rid of the negative things that we are feeling that we don't want to feel anymore. And the second part is to try to put some new feelings in place that are better than the old ones. We not only want to try to try to push away from some of the things that we don't want, we're also trying to pursue the things that we do want so that we actually feel satisfied rather than just not dissatisfied. If we change the way that we see the world, we can change the way that we feel the world. And the first part we want to try to see is that we generally feel the world when we start by saying that something happens and that that leads to some sort of an emotion or a feeling. We want to try to notice two key features here. One is that we're not in control of the something that happens. We're not in control of our circumstances. And we're also not in control of our emotions. The important part is the way that you see the world affects the way that you feel the world. And if it feels like you're not in control of your life and that you're not in control of the things happening around you, it might be because we see the world as though something that we can't control is happening and causing something that we feel which we also can't control. We end up feeling trapped and it makes it very difficult for us to be able to make forward motion or progress. What we wanna first try to do with the technique is to notice when we're doing this, and to try to intentionally disbelieve it. The next step is going to be, what do we do instead of that? We wanna to try to see that in the middle between the something that happens is an opinion or a belief. And it's the belief or the opinion that leads the emotion to happen, not the something that happens. We can prove this to ourselves that, uh, let's say somebody yells at us and we're combating social anxiety and that usually makes us quite petrified or upset. That if we don't have an opinion or a belief about someone yelling at us, let's say for example, they're five miles away and you didn't hear them. They yelled, but you didn't get a chance to actually know that they did it our emotion doesn't end up triggering. And it might seem like, well, duh, I didn't hear them. But the point is that it's not the yelling that caused the emotion. It's when they yelled, you heard it and you thought something about it. Something in the middle occurred here. And without this middle step, the emotion doesn't follow. Our opinions and our beliefs, the way that we see the world is different for everybody. Some people will take a look at yelling and it will lead to feelings of feeling insecure. Some people are from loud and boisterous environments and yelling just feels like it's normal. We want to try to see that though we can't control the some things that happen or our feelings, that we do have some control over the opinions or beliefs that we have about the world, that we do have some control over how we see the world, and then that will in turn change the way 
that we feel the world downstream. If we can get into a mastery, mastering how to influence our opinions and beliefs, things can change as a result. In order to do that, and in order to sort of make friends with our feelings, we want to try to create a different context for how our feelings actually interact with us. And rather than them happening to us, whether we believe that right now our emotions are rewards or punishments, that we're constantly seeking to be happy so we can be rewarded with how great that feels, or we're trying to avoid being punished by how anxious or depressed that something might make us feel. Instead, we want to try to see that emotions are a neutral force in our life. And that in general, they fit under the tools category. It's an important distinction because the tool itself is, in, is inherently neutral. My pen here is a really cool tool that helps us to talk about a whole bunch of different things. This is based off of a 2000 year old philosophy called stoicism. Or I can throw the same pen into the washer with all of my clothes and completely ruin my day. The tool doesn't really understand the context that I'm putting in it. If we can change the context with our opinions or beliefs, we can change what the tool does. And when we use different ones, there might be different tools for different circumstances. We want to realize that all of the negative tools that we end up using, or rather, all of the tools that we end up using in negative circumstances, uh, we can use in, in better circumstances where they do end up being useful. And all of the ones that we consider to be positive, such as being happy, are also tools in that we don't want to be happy in every circumstance. For instance, you don't want to be happy in a burning building. You don't want to be happy while you're crossing the street. You don't want to be happy when you're making a major life decision that could change everything for you and your loved ones. It's important in those situations for us to feel different tools. We can use the right tools in the right circumstances to get the best chance at living a more effective life. And that's part of what this technique is aiming to do. We want to be able to see that there are three tools that tend to get us into the most trouble. And they are anger, anxiety, and depression. And in order to see how these are tools instead of just terrible things that happen to us, we're going to try to take a little bit of a look at, try to imagine your favorite food. We're gonna take a look at depression first. Depression is a tool that helps us to hide from danger. All three of these techniques, all three of these tools help us to address danger in different ways. And depression helps us to hide. It says, avoid making things worse. Try not to put yourself in danger unnecessarily. Wait for help to come. Sometimes problems fix themselves, but above, above all other things, don't make things worse. So the, the way that we're going to look at that is we're going to see that there are nine general symptoms of depression that we will screen for. And we're going to take a little bit of a look at if you have something that is your favorite thing to eat and you wake up one morning and you want to eat this thing, let's say it's tacos, read your mind. Why? Of course, why would it not be tacos, right? You want to eat tacos worse than anything you've ever wanted to before. It's completely on your mind. You have no idea what you're going to be able to do in your life without tacos immediately at this moment. You grab your keys, you grab your phone, you run out the door, and you realize that it's blizzarding two feet an hour, and that it's very unlikely that you're going to get tacos. What do you do? We want to be able to see that these three emotions and that our emotional tools in general function in the background to try to autopilot us toward or away from danger or other results that we might want. Some emotions help to move us towards repeating things that are worth repeating or gaining valuable things. And some emotions like these ones help us to avoid certain things. Depression has nine symptoms that will autopilot you away from danger if you let it. So you wake up, 
You want tacos. You walk outside. It's blizzarding. If you feel the nine symptoms of depression, they will automatically guide you closer to safety. And they work like this. This is from the PHQ-9, and it's one of our most common depression screening tools in the field. You usually get a miniature version of this whenever you get a physical for your, from your PCP. The symptoms work like this. Lose interest in doing things so that you don't go outside where it's dangerous and you stay inside where it's safe. Lose hope in trying to get tacos so you don't go outside where it's dangerous and you stay inside where it's safe. You lose energy, you lose your appetite, and your sleeping patterns change so that you stay inside where it's safe, you conserve your calories, and you avoid going outside where it's dangerous. We lose our ability to concentrate, and we have difficulty with uh, getting distracted easily. And both of those things help us to stay in place and find something distracting to do instead of going outside and getting ourselves in trouble trying to find tacos. We start regretting about the past, the last time that we got stuck in a snowstorm and how we never wanted that to happen again. And then the last one is suicidal ideation, where we think about if I did get the tacos, but I died in the process, and we simulate our death in our minds, would it be worth it? And we quickly think, no, it wouldn't be worth it. If, if we lose our lives for these tacos, we give up on all of the tacos of the future, and that's definitely not worth it. These nine symptoms will work in the background without you even having to think about them in order to keep you safe in place and not going out and doing something that's dangerous. What we want to try to see is that if we sometimes have an opinion that we're in danger when we're not, if we trick ourselves, this tool will try to help us to hide from something that's not dangerous, and then it's not going to be helpful, it's just going to cause us more difficulty. We want to try to see that the other emotions work the same on this list. Anxiety does the opposite. It helps you to run. You've decided not to go outside to get tacos. You're going to stay inside and watch Netflix. But then you notice the smoke detector and your building is on fire. What do you do? We want to be able to see that if we try to use our mind to get out of a burning building, we very frequently won't get out of the building in time. It can take two to 3,000 different decisions in order to get up off of the couch, down the stairs, and out to the street. We smell, is that smoke coming from the kitchen? Yes, no. Is that smoke coming from another apartment? Yes or no. Is that carpet that's burning? Is that wood that's burning? Is that many other things that are burning? It's a whole bunch of decisions to get through just to figure out if your house is on fire. Eventually, you get through a couple more hundred decisions and you get to the stairs and you ask yourself, do I use my left foot or my right foot to go down the stairs first? We don't want to come up with all of these decisions in order to get out of a burning building. We want to be able to see that our emotions are heuristic algorithms. An algorithm is something that uses a series of if-then statements to try to push you in a general direction towards a general outcome. And a heuristic is something where we cut through the red tape and we cut a bunch of corners, not to get to the most efficient answer, but to get to the quickest, dirtiest answer that, that may solve most of our problems. And that's really what we want anxiety to do to function in our lives that when we're in physical danger, that we quickly prioritize getting out of that danger without thinking about it too much. Because if we do, we might miss the window for being able to get to safety. Anger helps us to fight, and that completes the fight, flight, and freeze trifecta, where anger gives us bravery, it gives us courage, it gives us recklessness, it lets us have callousness, which lets us disregard the feelings of others so that we can prioritize our own in order to make sure that we get to stay safe. And like I had mentioned earlier, what we want to try to see is that if you do try to use anger, anxiety, and depression on something where you're not actually in danger, we can cause ourselves a lot of difficulty. 
and we want to try to see that the danger is not something that happens. Something happens, and then we say whether it is dangerous or not. And if we say that it's dangerous when it isn't, these emotions will spark, like a hand reaching for a tool. Our opinion will reach for one of these emotions to try to fix our situation, and it won't have a whole lot of success if we've coded the thing wrong. One of the key points of cognitive therapy and rational mode of behavioral therapy in particular is first to try to see if we can change the patterns of opinions and beliefs that we have to be more in alignment with the goals that we have. We can change the emotions that follow. What we want to try to see is that there is a pattern of opinions that tend to put us into more of a mindset that something could be wrong or that we could be potentially in danger. And they all have something very similar in common. They're all black and white, and they all have this or else philosophy housed inside them. And they work kind of like this. It needs to be this way or else. It should be this way or else. It has to be this way or else. It must be this way or else. It will always be this way. It can never be this way. This way every time. It can only be this way. It's supposed to be this way. And the local special, I am told, is gotta. And I've included that over the years after many local buffalonians have told me that this is just the way that it's got to be it's this list has got to have this word on it what we want to be able to see is that if something happens and we use one of these words or a combination of them to explain what's happening we are going to put ourselves in a situation where we feel like we're in danger and we're going to reach for one of these emotions and it's not going to be helpful for social anxiety, we'll often get into the place and state of mind where I shouldn't say the wrong thing. And it's an interesting statement because we usually leave it off at that. However, there's a second part of the sentence that we leave a little bit of a mystery. And out of all of the things that human beings are terrified of, mysteries, the unknown, is the most terrifying. I shouldn't say the wrong thing or else. Otherwise you could say the wrong, right thing or the wrong thing, and then anything could happen. But when you say that it shouldn't, there's an implication that something terrible could happen if you don't say the right thing or if you do say the wrong thing. And this or else implies that I'm in danger. And when we do that, when we use a need, should, or a have to, it ends up leading to an emotional tool that's not going to help us. We end up getting angry at ourselves for having said the wrong thing. We'll get angry at the people who put us in that situation. We'll get anxious and try to run away from it. We'll get depressed and we'll try to hide from it. Our cringe response activates. We try to isolate ourselves so that we can't spread all of the terribleness that we are amongst all of the people out there who could be listening to us. We overdramatize it, and we end up trapping ourselves into a, a cycle of thought that we are in a social situation, and we shouldn't say something wrong. We pressure ourselves. The pressure does not resolve, and it doesn't fix our problem, because there's no danger to fix. The something keeps happening. Our opinion keeps triggering. The feeling keeps getting reached for. And it goes around and around and around and around and around. This pressure gets larger and larger and larger. And then we'll look for a place to vent it. And that's the most unhealthy way 
to deal with it because after we vent it, what ends up happening is that feels like it's a relief and it encourages the cycle to continue as opposed to trying to avoid building the pressure up in the first place, which is what cognitive therapy hopes to achieve. What we want to try to see is that the needs, shoulds, and have tos are very dramatic and we can almost see that we're conjuring the spirit of Jerry Springer when we say five of them in a row, for example. It's kind of like chanting Beetlejuice, only we get Jerry Springer instead. So, for instance, you need to be this way. You should have been like this. It's always like this. It's never going to be better. You were supposed to be like this. It's got to be different than this. And we don't even know what I was talking about. And it sounds frustrating and anxiety-ridden and dramatic. We don't want to make it so that our opinion is that we're on the Jerry Springer show because then we're going to feel defensive like we are. We've got something to defend. There are only five things that we really have to defend that the needs, shoulds, and have tos work with. They are food, water, air, shelter, and sleep. Absolutely everything else in our lives is optional. What we want to try to see is that if we do say a should or a shouldn't or a need or a need not or any of these other words about something else other than these five things, we're trying to add something to this list. Like, say the right thing. And I think after just a second of looking at the six things that are on this list, we can see that one of them does not belong there. We want to be able to see that the key feature keeping these five things in alignment is that you do need food or else you're in danger. You should have water or else you're in danger. You always need air or else you're in danger, etc. And if you do not have one of these things and you need them, these emotions will help you to get them. If you don't have food, you'll get hangry. Maybe you're more likely to steal a coworker's lunch. That allows us to practice that callousness where we disregard the feelings of others in order to make sure that we are taken care of and that we're safe. When we get dehydrated, we get anxious. We try to run away from our situation and we try to seek water somewhere else where it's safe. And we don't notice it, but the depressive response helps us every single night to go to sleep. Those nine symptoms of depression I was talking about, all nine of them are symptoms that you feel at the end of the night when it's dangerous to stay up late because you need sleep or else you're in danger. You lose your ability to concentrate. You get distracted easily. You lose energy. Your sleeping pattern changes from the rest of the day. We lose interest in doing things, etc. And that helps us to find a warm, dark place to hide for the night. We want to be able to see that these emotions are not bad. They're at very best, or at the very worst, neutral. They're very successful at helping us to get these five things, but that is all they do. They will not make you look cool. They won't help you with avoiding saying the wrong thing. They won't help you with proactively saying the right thing. They're just pressure in the background. They're algorithms and they're heuristic. They autopilot you towards getting these five things met. The first part of therapy, as far as the ABCs of emotion are concerned, which is the this. I've uh, dressed it up and changed some of what some of the words and what some of the vernacular is so that it makes a little bit more sense in 21st century English and incorporated a couple of other small things to uh, perhaps explain some of what's going on from, from my own perspective. But the framework is the same. We've got an activating event we have some sort of a belief about the event and that leads to some sort of emotional consequence. There are three more steps and we'll get to those shortly. But the first part of this is to realize 
that if we can be very careful at trying to police our language and police the beliefs that we have in our mind, to be careful going too close to the black or white, all or nothing, 100%, 0%, pass, fail, or else words. And if we can avoid doing that, our world becomes much more nuanced and we get to see the options that are present rather than trying to white knuckle everything. Some people can be very successful with white knuckling through things. They can say, I need more profit. I have to have more profit. It should be this way. It's supposed to be this way. And they can pressure themselves really hard into being very successful. However, at some point, we all end up burning out and we have a difficult time with actually making things profoundly meaningful in our lives because meaning isn't a need, should, or a have to. In the very short term, meaning is not a need. We want to be able to see that anything that we use in need should or have to affect our physical survival in the short term. And that everything else, money, sex, comfort, any number of different things are not needs in the short term for our survival. Plenty of people live without them all of the time. I usually use the Karate Kid as an example here. That Daniel goes to Mr. Miyagi and he wants to learn how to destroy people. And Mr. Miyagi, the wise old man that he is, rightfully agrees to show Daniel how to destroy people. And so he goes about making him do a whole bunch of house chores all summer long. Daniel gratefully does them resentful through the middle and toward the end he's even more bitter about it realizing that he hasn't learned how to destroy anybody he's just wasted a whole summer he goes to Mr. Miyagi and he vents his complaint and Mr. Miyagi proceeds to throw a bunch of punches and kicks at him and Daniel automatically knows how to move everything out of the way to keep himself safe because Daniel has learned muscle memory through doing a whole bunch of boring menial tedious things all summer long I'm trying to show you that if you can do the boring, tedious, prolonged activity of noticing the needs, shoulds, and have tos in your daily life, that you can create a mental muscle memory that when something happens, your opinion will be less rigid and will block these words out of the way, making it less likely for you to feel these feelings. What we want to try to get to a state of being is trying to set it up so that when we say one of these words, we snap our fingers, we knock on something, we pinch a wrist, we do something to try to call our attention to it. And if we call our attention to it, that creates a space in our mind that when we're about to say a need, should, or a have to, that normally this will go through so fast that you'll find yourself angry before you even know what it is that you said or what you meant. Sometimes we don't say them out loud, but we mean them on the inside. What doing an activity like this does is it balloons some air into that space so that when something happens, we've got more of a thought blocking technique there to screen. Oh, I shouldn't say the wrong thing here. What's a better way to say that? How do I want to see the world? How do I want to feel the world? How do, we, how do we change that? And that's what the second part of the technique is all about. We'll be taking a look at that here in a moment. But the first part of it is, can you create a, mess, a mental muscle memory for yourself or trying to avoid saying the things that lead us to inefficient tools for the job? And that's the first half of the technique. What we want to try to see for the second half of the technique is to notice that if something happens, like we're in a social situation and we notice the need should or have to, and there's two ways to do this. One is the opinion happens and we say, I shouldn't go out tonight because I might say something stupid. And we notice the shouldn't. It stands out in our mind like it's a cuss word and you just cussed in front of a teacher when you were six years old, and you're like, ooh, just said a bad word. 
we get into that mental state where we understand that we're cruising for a bruising and that eventually, if not right away, the needs, shoulds, and have tos are going to bring us to these tools. And we're going to get upset with ourselves in our situation. We either notice the opinion when we say it, or we notice the emotion that we reached for and then backtrack. Okay, I'm feeling angry. What the need shouldn't have to. I'm feeling anxious. What's the need should or have to? I really know I should call that person back, but I'm going to scroll on my phone instead. The hide response. We'll get into it in a, in a later module, but if we feel laziness, if we feel procrastination, if we feel anything that we notice isn't moving ourselves forward and it's instead stalling for time, depressive response. Look for the need, should or have to. Saying, don't make things worse. Wait for the problem to fix itself. But that phone call is not going to fix itself. You're going to make it at some point. Let's change the way that we look at it instead. If something happens, we either notice the emotion or we notice the opinion. And we say, let's do a reframe. Let's change this into something else, something healthier, something that's going to get me what I'm actually looking for. We're going to follow four general guidelines that are going to be the ingredients for baking the cake of success. And we want to realize that the first one is to ask ourselves why, and specifically, the why is going to be about why shouldn't you say something wrong? What's the motivation there? We're going to bore it, boil that down and we're going to keep asking, well, why this and why that? Until we get to a core principle. Like it's a Russian nesting doll. We're going to take a look at why shouldn't I say something wrong? Well, because then I'll look stupid. Well, why shouldn't you look stupid? Well, I want to look smart. Oh, you want to look smart. Well, what's looking smart going to do for you? And it says, well, maybe looking smart makes it so that I have a core group of friends. And what's a core group of friends going to do for you? It's uh, going to give me a sense of community, a sense of being able to communicate. I want to be able to communicate. That's the why. The second technique we're going to use is we're going to make a Punnett square here, and we're going to notice that we want to change need into want, and we want to try to change don't into do. We're not interested in don't need or do need. We already know where that leads, whether you should say, shouldn't say something wrong or you should say something right, then the should or shouldn't, regardless of how you phrase it, is going to lead to these things sparking, and that's not what we're looking for. We're also not interested in what we don't want, because what we don't want is a lose condition. And a lose condition isn't going to help us succeed, it's going to help us avoid failing, which is a very important distinction. If you're trying to teach somebody how to play a game for the first time, and they've never learned how to play this game before, they don't know any of the rules. If you try to only say what you don't want them to do, they can't win. Don't go backwards, don't go off sides, don't drop the ball, don't let the other team win. If they do all of that perfectly, the very best they can hope for is to draw. But we never play perfectly. We get into a situation where at some point we make a mistake. And if you make even one mistake trying to avoid losing, you lose 100% of the time. However, if you aim for a win condition where you're trying to win something, we're able to actually approach satisfaction in something. You do want to coordinate with your team. You do want strong form. You do want to score more points than the enemy team. 
you do want to have good strategy. You want to have strong tactics, etc. If we focus on all of those things, we will win much more frequently or even at all because we are aiming for something that's reproducible, that uh, any amount of effort that we're spending towards winning is going to put us more in a position where some sort of successful outcome is coming out as opposed to avoiding losing. So we've got two ingredients so far. One is making sure that we're sticking close to our why, that it's a win condition. The third one is going to be about a generalized skill set. And the, the key purpose of this is to make something transferable. We don't want to solve some super specific, I shouldn't say exactly this in front of exactly so and so. We can spend a whole bunch of mental energy trying to be perfect at this one specific speech that we're going to give. But then what? What about all of the speeches to come? What about all of the interactions that happen after that? We spend all of our energy doing a one by one the, our entire life. We're not going to get anywhere. We want to try to see that if you're trying to move a bookshelf, that the bookshelf is too heavy to move by yourself. And it's a special bookshelf because it's in your mind. So no one else can help you to move it. That you know you've got to get stronger in order to move this bookshelf. And so you come to a mental health gym like mine or another therapist. And we try to come up with a treatment plan. And if at first we try to say, well, let's make your bookshelf moving muscles stronger. That sounds like a good idea until we try it and we realize there are no bookshelf moving muscles. It's way too specific. You don't want to just move bookshelves. You want to be able to lift heavy things, generalized, so that you can lift other heavy things. This week, it's the bookshelf, and then the sofa, and then the table. And then the week after that, we're helping to move your career or a relationship or many other things that are also heavy in our lives. We want to be able to move those things, too, in our efforts, which are going to be considerable, will want to be able to, to grow us in such a way that our strength is able to move those things too. The last ingredient is to make it something that we control. And we want to be able to notice that out of all of the factors that are here on our list, we talked about this here at the beginning, that we're not in control of the something that happens for ourselves or other people. So we can't say, I want such and such to happen, or I want to win the lottery. Even though it's a do want, it's a win condition. It's not something within our control. We can't say that we want to feel something because we're not in control of our emotions. And we can't say that we want someone else to feel something. We're not in control of our own emotions, let alone are we in control of other people's emotions. What we want to be able to see, too, is that our emotions are tools and that we don't want to say that I'm going to go into the garage and I'm fixing my car and I'm bringing my hammer. And that's the tool that I'm going to use no matter what the problem is. Different tools are good for different circumstances, and we want to use the right tool for the right circumstance. So when we're changing this into something else, and we're talking about a do want in general, addressing our why. It's not going to be about something changing externally. It's not going to be about our feelings or someone else's feelings changing. And it's also not going to be changing somebody else's opinion. It's going to be changing our own. Out of all of the six things that are here, the only thing that we are in control of is our own attitude towards approaching our situation. I'm going to paraphrase Viktor Frankl here that out of all of the human freedoms, the last one is our ability to choose our attitude in any given set of circumstances. This is coming from a psychiatrist who survived Auschwitz. Real stuff in its stoicism in action. We want to see what is the attitude that you want to have in this circumstance. Following these rules, 
and making sure that we're addressing our why. If we take a look and we see that I want to be an approachable person with something to share. We're addressing our desire to communicate. It's a do want. It's not saying I don't want to be somebody who has nothing to share. It's saying I do want to be someone with something to share. It's in general. This can apply to many circumstances. It's not saying I want to tell so-and-so that I have feelings for them and I want them to respond in such and such a way. It's not that. It's in general. And it is within our control. This is about our attitude. This is about us becoming an approachable person, which is an attitude, being approachable. What we want to be able to see is if we focus on the process rather than the result of being an approachable person. The process is practicing the things that an approachable person does, as opposed to aiming to be the person who is approached. I'll break that down a little bit. If two ice skaters are competing in the Olympics, and they're both going for the gold medal, and one of them gets on the floor, and they're thinking, gold medal, gold medal, gold medal, gold medal, and they're doing their routine, and the other one gets on the ice, and they're thinking lunge, twist, jump, kick, flip, land, lunge, twist, jump, etc. The person who's focused on actually doing the thing that they're aiming to be successful at is more likely to get the gold medal. And even though the other person is thinking gold medal, gold medal, gold medal, gold medal, they are less likely to receive the gold medal because... The second one is focusing on the approach. They're focusing on the process of doing the thing that gets the result, not the result itself. We don't want to build you know, a small campfire and before we light it, just scream fire at the campfire, at the logs and, and hope that they light on fire because that's the result we want. There's a process to building a fire and there's a process to becoming an approachable person. And while this statement is very general and vague, we want to be able to come up with 10 very specific behaviors that we can watch and see ourselves doing and hold ourselves accountable to doing to be able to, if this is a muscle, what are the 10 things I can do to flex that muscle to see it happening in my life so that it's getting stronger? One thing might be to, whenever you're paying for something, go to the cashier line with cash and have five exchanges. You have social anxiety, it's terrifying to do, but we wanna be an approachable person. So we're going to do the things that approachable people do. We're going to say, Small talk is a ridiculous thing that only the plebeians and casuals use, that we're a deep person who only talks about deep things, only that people shouldn't waste their time with small talk, etc. And that's just going to make us angry and frustrated. And instead, we're going to say, well, saying hello and knowing how to introduce yourself is an important part of being an approachable person. So you're going to do it over and over and over again. You're going to go to cashiers with cash so you can't use the self-checkout line. And uh, there's an important part to using cash where you go to your bank and you go to the teller and you get cash instead of just going to the ATM. And you're going to have five exchanges. Hello, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you very much. Can I help you with anything today, etc. You want to go back and forth five times. If you can take it further than that, good for you and keep practicing. 
if it only sticks with that, try to start with that for now. Another one might be practicing a joke, having something funny to say, taking a look at a couple of one-liners or two-liners, something to break the ice and get people to laugh. Let's say the third one is to share a secret. Let's say we show somebody a small little vulnerability about ourselves to see how they might treat that so that we can see if we can share some more vulnerable things about ourselves at a later time. Say something small, something that's uncomfortable, but not off-putting. Maybe it's your most cringeworthy favorite song to listen to while you're working out, something like that. Can we get used to sharing that kind of thing about ourselves? It gives people an opening to potentially share something about themselves. That gives us something to share. Can we develop an interest? And do that thing at least twice a month. So that we do have something to share. Can we practice meta meditation? I won't go into the full spiel here. It's something pretty easy for, for you to Google. It's a love and kindness meditation. It helps us to consider somebody who's close to us, somebody who's neutral, and then somebody who we very much might not like very much. And finally, to focus on ourselves and to wish all of those people and ourselves, may you be well. You can take a look at some of the prompts there are online. But the general idea is to get more used to assuming the best of intentions with inside of ourselves and trying to wish people the very best. If we could get good at doing that on a consistent basis outwardly, it helps us with being able to not only express those things outwardly, but also inwardly. Six might be just assuming the best of intentions. Someone says something mean or frustrating, maybe we give them a pass. We've all had difficult days. Perhaps we get into a situation and we're able to say, you know what, I've been there a couple of times myself, just going to give this person some space and try again later. You might have 3.5 conversations. Same way that you can write a 3.5 essay. There's an introduction. There's three points in the middle and a conclusion. If we're going to have a very difficult conversation with somebody. Let's say it's a boss or it's a partner. And we're really trying to convince them of something. We're really trying to convince at, or at least express our point of view. Start with an introduction of this is why this is important to me. These are the three things I've noticed. Is there a way for us to work around this together? Can we set something up? Can we make something happen? That might help us with being able to structure our conversations a little bit so that we don't get lost rambling. You might offer compliments. Perhaps we even start with a quota before we get used to it. Say you've got to give two compliments a day. Maybe it's on your commute. If you have a commute, you're on the bus, and your objective is to contribute towards somebody smiling before they leave the bus. I like those shoes. It's a nice outfit. Where'd you get that coat? Something small like that. At the beginning, it'll feel rather artificial because you're trying to do it and keep track of it. But as it becomes second nature, as it becomes its own muscle memory, it gets easier and easier for us to give those out in a more natural way because we've developed the muscle so that it's strong enough to behave on its own. Perhaps one is to tell someone you've been thinking about them. Oh, 
baseball got people potentially that you've fallen out of contact with. Can we think about those people? Reach out to them. Be the first person to reach out. Perhaps we feel bitter that they haven't reached out to us first. Assume the best of intentions. Practice the meta meditation, wishing them well. Reach out to them and see, can you be the one who rekindles that? Even if it's just something casual. Can we establish some healthy boundaries? One thing with being approachable is that we won't don't want to be too approachable to the point where people can push us around and say whatever they would like to say and overthrow anything that we would like to share. Can it be something where we're being a little bit careful about who it is that we're associating with? Can we make sure we're giving ourselves enough space? Can we make sure that we're giving them enough space? Can we define what space even is in the first place? If we're able to practice these 10 things, and you can come up with a list that's 100 long if you'd like, it gives us options for making what we want come into reality. And when we focus on what we want and growing our win condition so that it's bigger and bigger, we end up getting to approach better feelings and better situations for ourselves. The feelings of happiness, motivation, confidence, the things we would consider positive feelings, are feelings that allow us to continue doing something that's worth continuing. They don't help us to start doing something worth continuing. You don't start with an emotion and feel motivated and then do something and then have an opinion about it. Something happens, we think about it, and then we feel something. If a challenge arises and we've come up with a plan for approaching that challenge, we will feel motivated to try to approach it. If you don't come up with a potential solution or at least in a strategy to approach the problem, the motivation will not trigger. It will not happen. Happiness is the same thing. It's that warmer or colder game that we've all played as kids. You blindfold somebody, spin them around in circles, and try to guide them to the other side of the room by saying warmer or colder. Happiness is a consistent warmer, warmer. You did the right thing. Keep going in that direction. You did it again. Keep going in that direction. You did it again. Keep going in that direction. If we focus on the process of doing the right direction, of doing the thing that's worth repeating, the happiness will take care of itself. We don't aim for the happiness directly. We aim for the thing that's worth repeating. The happiness will take care of itself. Kind of in conclusion, the first half is about avoiding the things that cause us the most trouble and to realize that when we're in trouble, that this is why. And the second part is trying to define the win condition um, or what it is that we would rather have instead. Instead of, I shouldn't say the wrong thing, it's that I want to be an approachable person that has something to share. How can I approach and how can I practice being approachable and having something to share? Here's 10 very specific things that I can do that I could practice on a regular basis. I'm going to try to do two of them a day. I'm going to try to do three of them a week. Anywhere you can start is going to be better than where you were. The more and more of these that we get to practice and the more and more of a routine they become within our own experience, the more desirable the result and the closer to the satisfaction we actually get. That's pretty much the, the end of the first presentation here. Thank you very much for watching. I'm looking forward to doing many more of these and talking through some of the different techniques as well as some of the other commonly held, call them illogical beliefs. Um, potentially towards substance use, depression, you can take a little bit of a look at trauma and many other topics to see what are the common things that we generally hold to be true that we need, should, or have to, and how do we reframe some of those in general. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. If you liked the video, please like and subscribe. I'm going to have some more content coming out. 
I appreciate the support. Thank you.